Science Magazine presents a special issue each year on the scientific breakthrough of the year. In 2008, it's reprogramming cells. We decided to honor cellular reprogramming this year because this year the technology really came into its own and scientists have started to use it in the lab to perhaps better understand human diseases. In past years, people showed that the technology was possible in human cells, but this year they took things a step further. And we're getting closer now to actually seeing the full potential that this uh, technology can offer to scientists. Well, all of us who are working with reprogramming owe a debt to Shinya Yamanaka, whose real paradigm shifting work occurred in 2006. We're using very similar techniques to affect the reprogramming now in human cells. But this is a major breakthrough because for many years we've been seeking ways to establish these cell culture models for human disease. And we finally achieved that. We should be able to generate disease models having the same genetic information with the patients those cells should be very useful in drug screening and in toxicology. Most directly, cellular reprogramming builds on two previous discoveries. The first was the discovery that you could keep embryonic cells alive in the lab. Ten years ago, Jamie Thompson's group delivered to us as scientists human embryonic stem cells. And those are the very primitive cells, the master cells of the human organism, that come from the earliest stages of human development, the blastocyst. Those cells are special because they can then, in the lab, in theory, become any kind of cell in the body. They can become heart cells, they can become brain cells, they can become blood cells. That technology was very exciting for scientists, but also brought a lot of ethical questions with it because it required the destruction of human embryos to make the cells in the first place. Um, and political debates and political rules limited some of the work that scientists were able to do with those cells. Those embryonic stem cells, however, are generic. They're, in most instances, essentially normal cells from normal individuals. So that doesn't give us the opportunity to study disease. The second discovery happened two years ago when scientists from Japan realized or discovered that they could take just four genes and by inserting four genes into the tail cells taken from mice, they could get those tail cells to behave as though they were embryonic cells, as though they looked and acted just like embryonic stem cells that were taken from mouse embryos. This raised great hopes among scientists that you could get embryonic-like cells in the lab dish without having to deal with actually using embryos and all the legal and ethical questions that surrounded that work. They called these cells, the Japanese scientists named these cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells. Based on the success of uh, cloning in frogs and in mammals, we thought that we should be able to induce pluripotency in somatic cells by introducing uh, some specific factors. And we hypothesized that if we induce pluripotency main maintenance factor into somatic cells, those factors might be able to induce pluripotency in somatic cells. Based on that hypothesis, we tried to identify uh, many factors that are involved in the maintenance of pluripotency in mouse ES cells. And we identified 24 such factors. And uh, out of those 24 factors, we found that the combination of four factors can actually induce pluripotency in mouse uh, fibroblasts. Uh, very luckily, it turned out that the exactly the same four factors can induce human iPS cells. Now in some instances, one can derive embryonic stem cells from embryos that are going through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. That is, couples who know they carry disease genes might test their embryos so as to prevent the disease in a child. So that has given us uh, models, embryonic stem cell models, of certain rare genetic conditions uh, like Fragile X syndrome or uh, Fanconi anemia. Uh, 
But the induced pluripotent stem cells, this new strategy of factor-based reprogramming, allows us to create a cell model for any person on Earth, and that means all of the many thousands of diseases that are represented in the human race. Scientists from several groups have managed this with at least 10 different diseases, including Down syndrome, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and several others. Another aspect of the breakthrough is that this year scientists figured out that they could use cellular reprogramming to turn one kind of adult cell directly into another kind of fully mature cell. That goes against all sorts of biological rules that people had thought. Usually the course of development is a one-way street. You, the cells choose their path and they don't ever, um, once they've gone down one path, they can't just jump over to another path and become a different kind of cell. This year, scientists figured out in live mice that they could insert genes into one kind of cell in the pancreas and turn it directly into another kind of cell, the cell that happens to produce insulin and is missing in diabetes. This suggests that perhaps um, the technology could be used not only to bring cells way back to the beginning, to their embryonic state, but also you could take, say, a skin cell and turn it directly into the cell of um, interest that would help you study or treat a disease. We know very little about how this works, how the three or four factors can induce prepotency in somatic cells. So I think uh, to understand those mechanisms is one of the most important future goals in this field. What we do know is that the reprogramming factors themselves are these master regulators. They're, in most instances, transcription factors. Those are proteins that bind to DNA and alter the expression of genes. In some cases, they'll turn genes on. In other cases, they'll turn genes off. But what they initiate is this global remodification of the state of the cell. Before the promise of cellular reprogramming, reprogrammed cells really becomes a reality, scientists need to understand a lot more about what's actually happening inside these cells. They know that the process works, they've been able to figure out several alternative techniques to make it work, and they're using those techniques to better understand what's going on. They have a few guesses about what these genes, these inserted genes, actually do to the cell to make it forget the developmental path it once took and go back to its undifferentiated state to the IPS cell state. Um, but they need to do some more work to really figure out what's happening and to really understand whether these cells are truly the equivalent to the embryonic stem cells that people originally had so much hope for and that people still have hope for um, using. One of the questions that's often asked is whether induced pluripotent stem cells will replace the need for embryonic stem cells. I believe very strongly that they will not. My laboratory continues to study embryonic stem cells side by side with these new induced pluripotent stem cells. In fact, the embryonic stem cells remain the gold standard. After many years of studying embryonic stem cells, we have some comfort with their performance, and we don't, we don't know yet whether the induced pluripotent stem cells are in fact identical. They are, have many functional similarities, and for the last year, we've spent a lot of effort trying to convince everyone how similar they are to the embryonic stem cells. But over the next many months, we're going to see a, a flurry of, of papers that will report critical differences between the iPS cells and the ES cells. And we don't yet know how relevant those differences are going to be to our ability to make use of them in research, let alone in therapy. So no, I think in the long run, we're going to see continued investigation of embryonic stem cells side by side with the new induced pluripotent stem cells. All I can say is we are doing, we and many other researchers are doing our best to bring this technology to patients as quick as possible. Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.